The reason I feel like I have a different take on this has a lot to do with the type of hunting I've been mostly exposed to over the last decade or so. The vast majority of my guiding career, my outfitting career, involves hunting heavily pressured elk in over-the-counter wilderness areas. So a lot of what I have to say is focused around that. In terms of habitat and needs, everybody knows the elk need cover, food, and water, right? Well, when we're talking about these wilderness areas and these areas with broad elk distribution, there's typically not a lack of that. There may be a ton of elk also, but they're gonna be widely dispersed. Just an example so you guys can see, I'm gonna show you a couple over-the-counter or really easy to draw areas in Colorado, and you're gonna see that cover, feed, water, it's everywhere. That's not a limiting factor for these type of elk. So here I am in Onyx to see just general habitat view. I actually prefer topo first because that's going to show me the water really clearly and you can see that here here's the dead center of the flat tops probably what's in the screen right here is 400,000 acres ish it's more than the actual wilderness area I think the wilderness area is 260,000 acres but you can see that there's water everywhere right I mean there there is literally water in terms of the elks world even when we're talking about the rut when they need to kind of be near some water you can see that there's water all over the place and then if we go to our satellite imagery look at the feed right we got feed everywhere we've got timber pockets everywhere so we've got cover so cover and feed to everywhere and you're going to see this exact same dynamic in the san juans again big over-the-counter areas areas that a lot of quotas go into look at all the water in this in these areas go back to satellite imagery Tons of feed in the alpine, on the alpine edges, on that transition area. Even down low, there's a lot of feed. You've got tremendous amount of timber for cover. So great elk habitat. All of these areas with huge tag allocations, the stuff you can hunt all the time for bull elk, you're going to find that there's phenomenal habitat all over the place. And that's why I'm not going to dive into that intensely, right? I'm not going to talk so much about slope angle for bedding areas, the availability for water. Colorado wilderness areas and these areas that are over the counter are just easy tags to draw, tags that you can hunt almost every year. Those elk, when you look at how the seasons lay out, a lot of those elk start getting hunted mid-August on those private land cow tags through your archery season, your standard rifle seasons, your over the counter seasons, and to late season cow tags either on the public or private all the way into January. So a lot of these elk, it's not only that they get a lot of hunting pressure at specific times, the duration of the hunting pressure is insane. So that sets them apart. For better or worse, they're not able to optimize for feed, water, cover. They have to optimize for not getting their asses shot. Throughout this video, I'm going to use Onyx. I've used Onyx for over a decade in all my personal hunting, all my outfitting, all my guiding. And I would say in the last two or three years, almost every day I've spent in the field, I've used Onyx at one point or another. And the guys at Onyx have hooked me up with a discount code you guys can use. It's going to give you 20% off. I'll put a link down into the description. You can click that link and subscribe that way, or you can go directly to Onyx. Just when you sign up, you can use the discount code. It's CliffG, C-L-I-F-F-G. If you guys are in the need for one of these mapping softwares, they're the guys I suggest. All right, so let's talk about the first obvious question. Which unit should you hunt, and then which part of that unit should you hunt my first piece of advice on this is don't fret it to the extent that you are almost everybody i know particularly new elk hunters they tend to get analysis paralysis on this and spend way too much time trying to pick the specific unit. I'll give you guys a couple tips here that should get it narrowed down and get you on the right first couple steps. But I want you to know this, every year, the opening day of archery season, the opening day of rifle season, there is going to be a hunter that shoots a big bull way, way back, 11 miles back in the back of some alpine basin in the wilderness area. He's gonna shoot one in there. And then literally within minutes, somewhere else in Colorado, there's going to be a hunter that shoots another big bull right on the border of BLM and a suburb with thousands of people living in it. When people say there are elk all over Colorado, that is true. The problem is, is they get widely dispersed, all right? Just keep in mind that even if you throw a dart at one of these over-the-counter mountain units in western Colorado, there's a chance that you're going to be right into the elk, okay? There's a pretty popular video on the channel called Why 5% of Hunters Kill 95% of the Elk. 
and I'll, I'll stick a link up here for you. But one of the concepts I talk about in that video is that these hunters that kill a lot of the elk and the hunters that are really consistent in these pressured elk areas, they know those elk, what their plan A, B, C, D, E, F is based on weather conditions, hunting pressure, all those different variables. So if you're new to an area, you have to start developing that off the bat, right? Figure out those spots, those different spots that elk go under different scenarios. If you can dig up what I would call stale information about elk hunting in a specific area, it can be very valuable when you're trying to narrow down to a unit or a subsection of a unit. And what I mean by this is if you know somebody in your town or you work with somebody or you have a connection with somebody who used to go out to Wyoming and they used to go out to Colorado 10, 11, 12 years ago and they tell you about these old hunts and they're willing to share information a lot of times. Maybe their elk hunting career is over. Maybe they're on to other adventures. Maybe they're just an older guy who doesn't have any interest in elk hunting anymore. A lot of times they'll give you specific knowledge on spots. We went up this trail. We found these wallows. They'll, they'll describe these situations and they'll be like, we were in elk every day. Don't discount that even if it was seven or eight, nine years ago. It's amazing how useful that stale information can be in terms of figuring out Elks plan A, B, C, D, E. You would be amazed how sticky that is over the years and how useful that knowledge is. Just reflecting on my outfitting years, I had pictures of my outfitting business way before my time, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I would look through those pictures and I would notice the locations, specific locations where old time outfitters were packing bulls out. I would look at those 30, 40 year old pictures and be like, I've been in that spot. I've packed bulls out of that exact spot many a time. So a lot of times those spots don't change over time. So if you can pick up stale information from anybody, utilize it. And this is a spot where you can utilize mapping software to take advantage of that. A lot of times people have vague understanding. They remember the creek they hiked up. They remember the creek that they got packed in up. They remember those details that can tell you how the road is. If you have mapping software, try to get those guys to talk to you and use the mapping software to narrow that down. It's amazing the detail that this mapping software has now. All right, so this one I'm trying to be anonymous with the spot a little bit here, so you have to bear with me. But this spot was actually described to me from an old time cattle rancher in this area. And the way he described it to me, you're on that rough as hell two track road. And he told me the name of the road. It's this road right here. You go on that road and you'll come to a spot where you can see down the canyon to your right. You can see down your canyon to the left. And here, here I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the topo here. I can see exactly where he's talking about. And he said, those canyons come tight to the road right there. And he said to me, man, when I used to hunt that country seven or eight years ago, those elk would always rut on the left-hand side of the road. You'd find them in there hiding out. After they'd been hunting for a couple weeks all around the surrounding area, they end up in there and I always had good luck there. And so I actually went back, found this point on the road, and then one thing that's nice about it is I actually remember scouting this via Onyx, and I noticed something cool. I, let's go back to satellite imagery here. Is right where he's describing, you can see that a spring comes up. I'm gonna blur that out so you don't, you don't see the name of it, but you can see that spring. I don't even think that he knew that spring was there, but those elk were obviously going in there because they weren't feeling the intense hunting pressure. They got other areas. But now that I know there's a spring in there, that even makes more sense. I've actually gone back into this area before, gone into that timber, and it's not far from a road. And in that timber, there's a few small seeps. And sure enough, to this day, a couple weeks into the hunting season, if you go into those seeps, you'll see the bulls are digging them out and have walled them out, and they're active in there. And they may not be going more than a mile and a half with their cows. They've got water. They've got some feed. They've got cover. But the main thing is that they can hide out from hunters there and there's pressure all around this area. That's an example where a little piece of stale information you can use.
use this mapping software to spice it up a little bit and it can turn out to be super valuable. And this idea may seem a little harebrained to you guys. A lot of you are gonna be like, well, I just don't have access to anybody that's elk hunting before. I think you're downplaying your opportunity. Somewhere in your town, you know, maybe at your shooting range, maybe at your archery range, you could be at a work event talking about elk hunting. If somebody brings up the fact that they elk hunted in the past, dig into that. that. That's a great way to get information. And just a caveat here, information from biologists, game wardens, I hate to say this, but usually it's close to useless. It does feel timely a lot of times. They'll say, oh, these guys were in this general area last year and they did pretty well. So you think, oh, that must be good information. So the biggest issue is this is information that these guys are giving out to a lot of hunters that call them, right? So almost by definition, even if that was a good area or a good spot, now there's gonna be more pressure and those elk that were in that area, they're gonna bump off into their plan C or D, right? So you have that dynamic as a problem. The other thing is a lot of these type of information providers, they have some inherent bias, right? You could have a warden that you talk to. He's continually having ag conflict issues with a particular center pivot down there that's growing alfalfa. Elk are always a problem there. He might suggest to you to hunt right outside of that center pivot, right? Well, turns out those elk never come off that center pivot and you're wasting your time, but he's hoping that your hunting pressure there will run them out of there and they'll go somewhere else. That's just a hypothetical example, but there's a lot of different incentives why some of these general information sources would have a bias in their information. So keep that in mind. But the biggest issue is they just give it to everybody, right? So it's not as useful, even if it feels like it's more timely. The last thing I'll say on this is when you're in the field, if you show up to your hunt a couple days early, or if you're just actively hunting and you're struggling, if you run into local people, particularly ag-related people, ranchers, farmers, those sort of guys that are always out in the field, if you chat with them and they give you information like, man, I used to go up this draw, we used to go up this little canyon seven or eight years ago, that's where my son got his first bull, we used to hunt that country a lot, but now it gets way too much pressure. Those little tidbits, you gotta dig into that, and a lot of times they'll help you out, they'll be like, oh man, you should go try it. You know, you should go try it, we haven't hunted it for years, I doubt it's any good anymore, but you should go try it. Sometimes those are little nuggets of awesome information because you go back in there and now the hunting is actually better than it was when they were there because they were the only guys that knew about it and they were the only guys hunting it. So those little pieces of information combined with your ability to do the due diligence with mapping software and really see the whole picture, those can be hugely useful pieces of information. All right, so let's say that you can't dig up anything on that front, right? You just can't dig up an old stale lead to save your life. The next thing you can do is just start randomly looking at units, pull them up on Onyx. You can look at Western Colorado, for instance. You can see a lot of the over-the-counter units, a lot of the units that are easy to draw. And you're gonna see that there is varying degrees of public land on these, right? So you can use that as a filter. You really don't wanna get into an area that has almost no public land. So you can see here, um, I don't, I don't know the exact status of these in terms of draw. Just to depict what we're talking about, if you look at 13 and 131 here, obviously not a ton of public land to hunt. You can see the shaded areas here. This is, this is BLM here. This is Forest Service here. But as you go into more of the mountainous units, 24, 25, 26, all these other ones over here, there's, there's tons of them. The same deal down in the San Juans. 33, 34, you're gonna see that the majority of these units are public land. So that's a decent filter right off the bat. If you're gonna go into a unit, at least make sure that you have some access and some huntable area. The other thing to do is just gut check yourself before you dedicate your time to a unit. Go into the state statistics and just look up that success rate real quick. You'll see if it's in that range from eight or 9% to 20% for these easy to draw tags, archery and rifle. It's basically run your mill, elk hunting country that's managed for opportunity over the counter, easy to draw stuff. All right, so that's just a gut check on the unit. It puts you in a spot where there's elk. They may be way dispersed, but there are elk in those areas. Particularly when we're talking about wilderness areas and a lot of this overlaps, right? A lot of the areas that are heavily pressured and there's tag availability, they tend to have wilderness areas in them. 
when you're looking at those areas, consider how you plan to hunt them, right? If you're gonna backpack hunt them, make sure that those wildernesses are big enough where when you go in two or three miles, you haven't gone across the wilderness. Some of these wilderness areas are small, so consider that. If you want to have that experience of hiking way back in there, then make sure the wilderness provides that. The other thing to consider is if you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to pack in to a wilderness area. You want to day hunt it, or maybe you want to be effective at covering ground and glassing as much of the wilderness areas as possible, and then doing kind of surgical attacks right big day hunts or just quick over the night backpack hunts that's a great way to hunt these wilderness areas particularly when you're new and you don't know all the different things that those elk do in that area if that's your mindset you have to factor that in in terms of where you choose to hunt let's jump on onyx here and i'll show you what i mean all right, so this is one of the meeker access points into the flat tops. I haven't hunted this section of the flat tops very much at all. I'm not talking about specific elk spots I know or anything like that. We're looking at this from the perspective of somebody that's doing their due diligence, thinking about going into a spot. This is how I would look at it. That's it. I'm not diving into any known spots as far as I know. Think about if you were trying to day hunt this part of the flat tops, right? Look how deep in here the flat tops go. All of, all of these areas here, all these long wilderness trails back in here, and then all the way down into the south, more where I used to outfit. But anyways, up here, there's a lot of country in here. So the question is, how effectively can we glass that from the road to tee up a multi-day trip or a big day hunt in there. By far the best way to figure this out is turn the map into 3D or use Onyx's Terrain X feature. And you can do a whole lot with terrain here, but for what we're looking at here, we just wanna put ourselves on that road, right? From like the bird's eye standpoint. You can see all my old waypoints back there, way in the flat tops. You can't see where they're actually pointing, but you can, you can see them on the horizon. But anyways, you can see here along that access point, you can just see the edge of the wilderness. It's gonna be very hard for you to actually glass off of this road to see much. You can see back in these little basins a little bit, but they're not very far off the road at all. But you can see a little bit of it, but there's so much across this plateau on the top that you can't see from the road. You can see all that. This is all wilderness area in here, all the way over into my old area. So really the only thing you can see from this road access here is just the edge of the terrain you can't see a whole lot and another tool you can use to kind of kind of see that is this view shed that uh, that onyx has basically you can take your little uh your little crosshairs here and you can put it on the road where you would be and it's going to show you what you could glass from there what you could see and that's going to be the lighted section if i put the glassing point here you can see in here i can glass and here i can glass back in here is all obscured if I go over here on the road, like right in here, I can see a little bit back into this space and a little bit back into this, this space, but I can't see any of this stuff actually back into the wilderness. It's gonna be tricky to hunt this section of this wilderness area this way, right? You're not gonna be that effective. Now let's look at a different setup in a wilderness area where doing that might be a little bit more effective. You can see here from the overview, the you know the standard view on mapping software, you can see how all these drainages here, they open up towards the road system, right? They're way back in there, but they are, the grain of the land is open towards the road system. I'll stick a link up right here of one of my glassing videos where I talk about the importance of the grain of the topography and your angle to that grain in order to be able to glass it. This is that same concept just with how the wilderness area lays relative to the road access. But we're gonna zoom in here, kind of put ourselves bird's eye view to the road. You're gonna need some serious glass to do it, but in this type of country and how this wilderness area lays relative to the road system, you can actually glass into a lot of nooks and crannies, move along that road system, try to find elk along the road system before you execute a plan to go in there for big long day hunts or a multi-day backpack hunt. It might take that in some of these drainages just to get back in there. The idea is the same. You can see that you can see back in here. And if you if you use this view shed, you're gonna see how you can maneuver some of these road systems and you're gonna get back in here 
and let's just put our glassing point say here for for the moment you can see that this opens up to your glass this opens up to your glass these little these little nooks open up to your glass and you can move along this road system these little spots and you're going to pick up little aspects of that deep in the wilderness stuff that you actually can glass in these situations you can actually figure out your public land access on the other side of the road and if you've got really good optics you can actually glass across way deep into the wilderness area but the point is every wilderness area is going to be a little bit different in this way you're going to be able to look into it to a certain extent from access points so you want to match that with the kind of hunting that you plan on doing when you filter down to the wilderness area that you're actually going to hunt all right so this is kind of related but if you're hunting rifle seasons particularly first rifle second rifle third rifle so we're talking about rifle hunts that generally fall between the 10th of october and around thanksgiving right or a little bit earlier say November 20th so in that window one thing with rifle hunting elk is whenever you choose the spots and you're doing this at home scouting to plan things out you need to consider what the elevation grade looks like and what that elevation grade looks like compared to the local private land and the reason this matters with elk and these wilderness areas and highly pressured areas once you do get some snow accumulation at those higher elevations elk are going to be more limited by the habitat they're going to have to go down where they can get feed out of that snow and at the same time all those spots they use to get away from hunting pressure those are going to be limited by the snow too they're going to be pushed into a much smaller land mass and generally that's going to be down elevation grade so what you want to do is you want to look at these areas and make sure you're going to an area that gives you some options and if it doesn't give you some options you're going to want to have a plan where hey if there's big snow accumulations we're going to go hunt this area and that area might be 20 30 miles away but you want to figure that out before you go on your hunt what you don't want to do is have a specific area all planned out all your camp spots in a specific wilderness area or on the edge of of a specific wilderness area and all that area is very hard to travel in and get around but the bigger issue is that all the elk in that area have pushed down to private land so first let's consider an area that could be limiting if there were to be a situation where snow pushed the elk down out of the wilderness area or out of the remote forest service area that you're hunting so in this situation we look at onyx here and we can see all these drainages up here there's lots of reasons to believe that there's probably some elk in this country up here right but once late fall comes they're probably going to move out of here we're going to look at elevation bands around 10,000 feet that's where snow in a general sense this is totally a generalization it can vary but by late October, most of that snow above 10,000 feet is going to start to stick and accumulate. So that's where you're going to see elk move out first is in that, in that band elevation above 10,000 feet. So here you can see all of this is still included in 10,000 feet. The, the majority of this stuff up here, and if we look at our original Onyx view, most of the stuff that's, that's all public, all national forest down here, some of it's BLM, some of it's private property, there's a bunch of ag, some center pivots. This stuff up here, a lot of it is above 10,000 feet. And if we start going down here, we get down to 8,000 feet, we're already starting to hit the valley bottom at 8,000 feet, we're starting to hit that ag. So you can imagine in this area, once you get big snow accumulation, you're gonna be pretty limited. These elk are gonna get pushed off this forest on the private fairly quickly and that surely could happen second third rifle season so you want to have contingency plans all right so here we're going to check out a very different area right everything on the standard onyx view here is either national forest or blm stuff that we can hunt right so we're looking at this area now let's open up terrain x and we'll do the same the same deal here right here we're including all the upper elevation bands Let's start to drop that down as if snow was coming in and it was essentially limiting access for those elk up high. What would that look like? So I've brought that elevation band all the way down to 7,500 and that would be pretty darn extreme. To get real significant two, three feet of snow, elk moving snow down to 7,500 feet, that would be pretty darn significant for a second or third rifle season. It happens, but it's not super common. But just in an extreme case, I want to show you that you can see all this country here that's within that lower band, that's still huntable. It's still on BLM, right? So in this case, 
this area when we're planning a hunt it lends us more options if we're hunting those rifle seasons right we don't necessarily have to have a plan to go hunt somewhere else where the lower ground is public and huntable right all right folks i hope you found that video useful now that we know how to narrow down to a broader area a specific unit or even a subset of that unit in the next video in this e-scouting series i'm gonna cover how to take that chunk of land that we're focused on and break it up in terms of where the hunting pressure is going to be and how those elk move off of that pressure. A big part of that is going to be understanding these wilderness trail systems, these pack trails that public hunters use, outdoor recreationists use, outfitters use. Over the years I've developed little rules of thumb that are really distance buffers on the different types of access. I'll show you those ideas and they're going to put you in a position to hunt these areas way more effectively. The other part of that video I'm going to cover is how to find those glassing spots and how to plan routes into those glassing spots that are gonna let you see into those little nooks and crannies, these little high basin bowls that are hidden from everywhere else. I'll show you how to get into those spots. In the meantime, guys, go check out this elk stocking video. Thanks for watching, guys. Good luck out there.